This is the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we teach you the proven methods to grow your seven-figure business to 10 million and beyond. Please welcome your host, Brett Gilliland. Welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast. Excited to have a new guest today that we have not had on the show yet. Uh, Another great founder who has some great business scaling uh, experiences and lessons to share with us. His name is Paul Wakeham. He is co-founder of a very innovative company in the real estate space called Town Square and uh, not spelled the way that it sounds. So we'll we'll get to that in a second. But Paul, I just want to welcome you to the show and thank you for being here with us. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Brett. It's It's an honor to be here. I'm looking forward to telling you about my business experience and seeing how we can relate on things and maybe work together. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So I mentioned that that if people are looking for Town Square, what you do, they're not going to type out the whole word or the, the whole two words of Town Square. That's Why right. Tell us, tell them how they can find your website so that they can get to know you a little bit that way. Yeah, it's a it's a running joke at our company that the the city of Nantucket if you're listening, the city of Nantucket, please sell us the domain town square spelled properly. Um, but you can find my company and myself at twnsqr.com. As all innovative tech companies do, we pulled all the vowels out because we didn't want to pay for the really expensive domain. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I love it. And and that speaks to the kind of the bootstrapping, gritty start, startup scene that we all start with. Um, why don't we why don't we start there? Why don't you yeah. tell us about Town Square and then your your growth journey over the last little bit? And yeah, we'll definitely. Into some of the lessons. Yep. So I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I graduated from the University of Penn, University of Pittsburgh, um, Pitt, and I have a degree in economics. As soon as I graduated, my girlfriend at the time now my wife bought me a drone uh, for my graduation present. And we thought it was just going to be a fun hobby. It turned into what has become one of the largest real estate photography businesses on the East coast. Um, And as the primary photographer bootstrapping that business, I got a lot of experience with high level real estate investors and agents that dealt with high level real estate investors. And it was really my first exposure to the world of real estate investing Uh, Fast forward to 2019, I met my co-founder, Mitch. Um, Mitch quit his job and we decided to create an algorithm to predict who was going to sell their house next in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania real estate market. Um, Right before COVID hit, I'll never forget, Mitch gave me a call as I was finishing up one of my last photography appointments ever. Um, And he said, man, we got 95% accuracy with our prediction algorithm in Allegheny County. And we were psyched. But then a couple of weeks later, COVID hit the entire country and the entire state of Pennsylvania, shut down real estate for four months. Uh, So all of that data was no longer useful, to say the least. And since 2019, 2020, we've iterated through different versions of Town Square to arrive at where we are today. Town Square today is a marketplace for real estate investors, wholesalers, really anybody who touches off-market real estate to post their properties with specific tools that we've built on top of that marketplace to help those real estate professionals with the sale of their properties. And we can get into what all of that is, but uh, yeah, that that's me in a nutshell. That's my background. All right. So uh, gift slash hobby turned into real estate photography business, and then you started to connect with the real estate industry, the market, the players, and understanding some of their needs. And then you guys found an interesting thing to create software. Uh, and that's what Town Square is. That's that's a really cool journey. Just getting yes. started, right? Um, still going, doing, yep. the, doing the thing. So we all expect to hear uh, and see Town Square in, in all the, the great you know, entrepreneurial publications now. That's that right. Heard you on this podcast. <laughs> That's right. right. Tech next, crunch. Next, here we come. <laughs> yeah, tech crunch. Next week will be tech tech crunch. That's right. So let's talk about some of your personal growth journey as a leader. And um, I know you're a co-founder, and I'm not. I, I'm not. Mitch isn't here to defend himself or, or <laughs> share some of his ideas. Uh, but we'll just focus on the things you're learning as a leader, as a co-founder. In a in a growing business, so you you get started. I mean, you had some good foundational experience with the with the real estate photography business. You start up this software company with your co-founder, 
aside from like product market fit kinds of things that that every software company has to figure out and actually every business has to figure that out that piece out what did you start to experience as you as you gain some traction as you look to organize this business what are some of the things you guys ran across that would i don't know you could put in this bucket of lessons i'm learning as a as a growing business owner yeah yeah, I think that one of the things that Mitch and I have both learned is that from the beginning, we were working and we still are, but we were working 14, 16 hours a day, six or seven days a week, trying to do absolutely everything. Whenever we had that algorithm, I had taught myself how to code very, very poorly, taught myself how to code. Um, but I think the most basic lesson that we learned is that we can't do everything and we were not going to have a successful business if we try to do everything. So one of our very first hires after we raised our first round of money for Town Square in early 2021 was my good friend from Pittsburgh. His name is Kevin. He's our director of sales so that he could take over the entire sales process. Really, if somebody knows anybody from Town Square, they either know me from podcasts that I've been on or they know Kevin because Kevin never stops calling our customers, checking in and making sure that they're happy with the platform and happy with the product. And he's been with us through different iterations of the business, always staying in front of the customer. So my biggest learning, pretty, pretty uh, standard, but my biggest learning has always been that if I can hire somebody and pay somebody to go and do a job that I could do, or I could coach them on, but I don't have the time to do because I'm trying to run the business, then that that's definitely been huge for us is hiring different individuals to take the workload off of Mitch and I, so that we can focus on building the business in a, in, in the further direction, rather than focusing on exactly what's happening today. Yeah. I love that. And, and it wouldn't surprise you that many of our guests point to that lesson, right? That's like one we all have to learn. Yeah. But what I want to underscore with this in particular is that you shared just now that you guys raised some money to be able to build this business. And whether you raise money or you bootstrap, there's still the question of how do I, how do I know when I can afford to hire somebody to take this? Because that's the other side. It's not that I mean, part of it is I have a hard time letting go because I want it done right, or I'm really good at it or whatever. Right. Like that's, that's one piece that's kind of ego driven, Oh yeah. but then, or, or, or fear, fear-based. Right. But Certainly. then there's this affordability thing. Like, how do I know if I, if I carve that role out, chunk it off and give it to somebody else, can I afford that now? Or do I need to get to a certain point in revenue before I can afford to do that? Yeah. You know, so I just love your thoughts on that question because a lot of people struggle with, can I afford to hire somebody? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely something that was a huge learning experience for me was hiring Kevin as our first employee. Um, you know, I thought Kevin was uh, at a high level sales position at Dell Corporation selling technology for Dell. And I thought, Town Square is technology. Dell has technology. Kevin's going to come in without any experience in the real estate industry, and he's going to know exactly what to do. Um, and that just wasn't the case. And that was a, a failing on my part where I needed to train Kevin and tell him about real estate and get him up to speed. So how can I afford it? What, what I've learned as we've hired more employees is, okay, I need to plan for here's their salary, but also here's how much time I need to allot. And can I afford that time that I set aside to get those employees up to speed? Now, Taylor, our other employee that we've hired uh, in the last year, he's a real estate expert. So he jumped in and knew exactly what to say when he was talking to real estate professionals. But in some cases, Kevin can help him with basic sales training things. And I can help with some feedback on sales calls that he does. Uh, so whenever I think about, can I afford them? To date, it's all been, do we have enough revenue? Do we have enough money in the bank? Have we raised enough money? But also a big consideration has been, do I have enough time that I can allot towards training this person to be the most valuable person they can be for our organization? Yeah, I, I've, I've seen the flip side of that happen over and over again. We're like, I need somebody to take this role. So post that poorly written job description, help <laughs> wanted, right? Post that sucker, get somebody in here and, and turn them loose. Yeah. Uh, only to have disastrous results. Right. So yeah. I love that you're making the point, Paul, that, you know, it's not just a money investment. It is a let's help them be successful investment. And yeah. why wouldn't we want to 
hire somebody that we want to see successful. And what do we need to do? Of course, we want to have somebody get in there and get up to speed as quickly as they can or has relevant experience. But I don't know of many instances where you just plop somebody in and they're they're running without any touch, right? Yeah. So really, really good point. All right. Yep. Um, what other what stands out as you think back over the the history of both of your businesses? Um, what stands stands out as other growth lessons that you've had to learn that might help other seven figure business owners who are trying to do that scaling thing? Yeah. The other big thing that sticks out that I've learned just across the board running this technology company is compartmentalizing my time when it comes to raising money. So you know, I listened to a podcast. Uh, about a year and a half ago or so from a really successful founder, um, his company, I forget exactly what the name of the company was, but they have sensors that they put all over public spaces to track how many people are traveling through that public space and how the built environment is impacting the movement of public and whatever. Um, whenever I was listening to him talk, a light bulb went off in my head because I had just finished raising money um, right as he was, right as I was listening to this podcast. And what he was talking about was how you're either in money raising mode or full stop, you're not in money raising mode. So for the last three months since we launched Town Square, really for the last six months since we started really working on these new products, I have been in full on, let's not raise money, let's make the business work mode. And like anybody who comes to talk to us about investing, I just say, hey, here's this investor deck that's from six months ago. I'm sorry, but I'm not in money raising mode right now. I need to focus on running the business. Come talk to me in the middle of Q1. When I'm in money raising mode, I'll have a beautiful deck and I'll put on a suit and tie for you and be the be the money raising CEO. But today I'm the operations CEO. So that's been a huge learning for me is that I heard that guy say money raising mode or your full stop, you're not on that podcast. And it's like, aha, that is so, so important because when I raised the first bit of money for town square, I was trying to do both. And the money raising process was painful. The business running process lacked because I wasn't doing just one or the other. Now, when I go to raise money in the beginning of next year, it will be, I'll still have to run the business. You know, there's, there's no question about that, but I need to, I need to remember that I'm not raising money right now. I'm trying to make the business run really efficiently right now. And I would tell anybody else that's in the, in the business of raising money or trying to raise money for their business, um, really focus on your business rather than raising money and your business. You know, Try to compartmentalize that and do one or the other as best you can because investors definitely take uh, a lot of energy to keep happy, rightfully so. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great point, Paul. I've, I've been around that process as well. And what, if any of our listeners have not gone through that, it takes a lot more time than you think it would. Like it just takes so much time. Not, and this isn't just finding potential investors and having initial conversations with them. But when you get into the whole due diligence process, it's, it's sometimes and, and often very painstaking step-by-step. Step. They want to know exactly what they're putting their money into. And you have to be able to go create reports that you've never done before, right? It's like, oh, you need that? Yeah, we just, you know, usually we just look at the bank account balance and we, <laughs> we kind of know what our outstanding bills are. And But they want to know, you know, these details at, at a level of, of sophistication that they're used to, even yeah. if your business has never done it before. So there's a lot of time and energy that goes into it. And then sometimes those efforts don't pan out. And so you spend all this time raising and with one, you know, potential investor, and then it doesn't work out and then you got to do it all over again. So super long process and, and hard to split yourself between fundraising and running the business. Yeah. Uh, but you know, like, as you referenced, like the business still has to be run. Yeah. But let's, let's stay focused on one big thing. And yep. uh, that's a great lesson. Okay. Yeah. So when you're not, so let's broaden the application on that. Not everybody who listens to this podcast is raising money or even wants to. A lot of entrepreneurs are very proud of, I mean, we bootstrap this thing and I'm never yep. going to take a dime from anybody. So how can this idea of compartmentalization serve somebody like that? Yeah. So my first company, the company that my wife runs, um, I should say my, my first successful company. I've had a couple of companies before the photography business that were not successful. <laughs> um, my first successful company is the photography business that my wife and I started. And that has been 100% bootstrapped. 
um, we, we had one drone and an old camera and we built a really awesome business from that, that gives us a lot of freedom. And we're very fortunate for that. But, um, the compartmentalization was definitely a, a, a big learning in that business as well, because I was the primary photographer for that business for the first two and a half years or so. And then we hired other photographers and had to train them. And I had to put myself in this position where I was no longer just taking the photos. I had to become a leader that was training these people. So I had to go totally in the other direction of not, I know how to take photos, just watch me. It's here, you need to learn how to take photos. I'll teach you how to take them. So that movement of my brain from the teaching space or into the teaching space from the just doing space um, really made a big difference for me when I was building that business. And I don't know if I would call that compartmentalization, but just being able to context shift uh, efficiently throughout my day. You know, I would still go out and take the photos and fly the drone in the beginning as we were hiring these people and being able to quickly flip over to, okay, now I'm going to teach somebody how to do this. It requires these steps. Um, that was, that was huge for me. Uh, and it was a difficult learning process, but I think we've really, really ironed it out to the point where our photographers now train new photographers. So I'm not only have to touch that process anymore. So yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely the biggest learning I've had in a bootstrapped business is figuring out how to train individuals that are going to be doing the same job that you're doing so that you can step out of it. So that you can step out of it. I love that you kind of punctuated that with that phrase. I have a good friend. Uh, his name is Clayton Mask. I reference him often on this podcast, but here's a quote that I think that you'll, you'll resonate with Paul. He says, entrepreneurship is an exercise in relinquishing control, <laughs> right? It's like, nice. as as I, like, I know how to do this thing. I had to learn it to get where we are, but in order for us to get where we're trying to go, I'm going to have to turn that over to somebody. And yep. you talked really well about that transition from I was doing it and now I got to, I got to teach it and give somebody else that ownership and relinquish that so I can do something else. Yeah. And that's the only way your business grows. Otherwise you're stuck at whatever you built at that point. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So what else, Paul? Well, think, think about your, I, I love that you've built a team before that we got on this podcast, you shared some of your leadership team or the functional organization that you have. Um, talk to us about what it means to, to, to build a, a team of capable functional leaders so that you don't have to think about that. Yeah. Uh, it's actually super important to me because I know that if Town Square, the technology company, is going to be successful, then employee number one, Kevin, employee number two, Taylor, and employee number three and four and five, as we hire these people, they're going to be leaders in the business. So what I think a lot about is we're, we're in the market right now to hire a couple developers. And we're not only looking at those developers as like one and done developers, we're looking at them as how can they be leaders alongside our CTO, my co-founder, Mitch. Um, so things that I'm looking for there are people that are like not just waiting for instruction and that can say, hey, you're actually doing this wrong. You can use this software package differently, or I figured out how to run this report. That's one of the things that I was so pleased with whenever we hired Kevin was he was not only doing the sales job, but he was also running reports and showing us things that we hadn't seen before because he was taking initiative as a leader of himself because he was only employee number one. Um, but that's what we're looking for is how do we build out a leadership team that is is new to a tech startup world, but also can lead themselves and eventually lead others because they're going to be the leaders of our company as we grow this into a giant organization. Yeah, they will be the leaders until they're not, right? Like at yeah. some point, maybe they, if they don't grow fast enough, then then you got to make some changes, which can also be painful. So yeah, um, heads up on that one. That's coming your way at some point. <laughs> you have all yes, these, yes. Like, really loyal early team members who help to lead and grow this thing. And then, and then you grow past their, their capability. And that's, uh, that's for another show, I guess, but yeah. Um, but I hear I'll you come hear back. You. Yeah. You have to come back and share about that one. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, uh, I, I think about these lessons that you've outlined and really getting focused, compartmentalizing, right. Learning how to shift from doer to teacher or enabler, right? Like how do I hand this off to somebody else? And yeah. then this concept of, boy, these, these key people we're hiring early on, 
I'm looking for leadership qualities in them because they need to help build the function and the business as we grow. Those yep. are all really, really great lessons. Uh, anything else that pops into your mind as, boy, if we hadn't done this, we would still be stuck, you know, where we were before. Yeah, definitely. So about a year ago, uh, I think it's next Monday or the, in a little bit, I'm not sure when this show will come out, but really soon Halloween is, is around the corner. And in 2021, Mitch, my co-founder and I had a really hard conversation. We looked at each other and we said, this business model of Town Square in 2021 wasn't working. We ran this new business model from late 2020 as we pivoted out of the prediction world um, and into this real estate marketplace. But the old marketplace was focused on the retail market, not so much on real estate investors, but rather on homeowners that were looking to connect with real estate agents. And to real estate agents credit, we just, you know, we can't do as good of a job as real estate agents. They're great professionals and we needed to stay out of their space. And we looked at our KPIs and said that exact same thing to each other. So one of the biggest learnings that I've had in the business as I've been trying to run this startup is how to be nimble and how to pivot quickly. So Halloween will be one year since we made a really big, drastic pivot in the business, decided to scrap an entire business model and say, let's go back to our roots. Let's go back to real estate investing and let the retail market with agents and brokers be the retail market. Um, and that was a hard pill to swallow. I haven't, I haven't made a cent since the middle of 2019 on this and to swallow our pride and say, this thing that we worked at for two years at the time isn't working. Let's go try something completely different and raise more money on it. Um, it was difficult. So that that's been one of the biggest learnings of my entire life, if not, you know, through the business just by itself. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And how, how, um, you know, it's a fun coincidence that that was around Halloween that you were taking a scary, scary step <laughs> at Halloween last year. And here you are, you survived the tail yep. um, and, and your revenue is growing and the team's growing and it's happening, yep. but it's, it, you know, in those moments, you don't know how it's going to pan out. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't really your point, but your point is really important. It's like, got to go with, with what the market's telling you and what you guys are good at at the core. And, you know, if you, if you need to match that and stack it a different way to yep. be flexible because something's not quite going well, then, then you got to do that. Yeah. Being nimble is, is, has been huge for Mitch and I, because in, in 2019 through the end of 2020, really the beginning of 2021, it was just Mitch and I running this business, morphing, you know, trying to figure it out, trying to stay nimble. And it's, I'd say if I were going to point to one thing that has led to any amount of success for any of the businesses that I've started or that I'm running is just making sure that I stay nimble and that my team stays nimble. Uh, Kevin kind of laughs at Mitch and I, because there's always something new every single week. Like, all right, we're going to tweak this just this way. And he says, nothing is ever just going to stay the same. Is it and like, no, it's not. We're always going to be changing to make sure that we can succeed. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you, Paul. Uh, your lessons today have been very valu valuable. It will help any of these business owners who are listening. If they they want to learn more about town square if they want to connect with you on social media what what are the best ways for them to do that yeah definitely so if you're interested in real estate investing and acquiring investment properties, you can check out Town Square at twnsqr.com. If you're a real estate investor who has properties to sell, you can also check out Town Square at the same place, twnsqr.com. You'll go through a whole onboarding process where you'll get on the phone with me and my team to get set up with your account to either sell or buy uh, off-market properties. Um, and then I'm kind of old school. Uh, I don't really have social media other than LinkedIn. If you can call LinkedIn social media, I yeah. guess you can. LinkedIn, yeah. <laughs> um, you can find me on LinkedIn, just Paul Wakeham, W-A-K-I-M. Uh, and then you can find Town Square across social media at T-W-N-S-Q-R. Very good. Well, thank you for being a guest today on our show, Paul. Thank it's you. Entrepreneurs like you who are out there making it happen that bring a ton of value and experience to this podcast. So uh, thank you again. Everybody listening, please share, like, tell other people about it because we want to help as many seven-figure business owners as possible as you all go through your growth journey. Thanks for listening and we will see you next time. Thanks, Brett. You've been listening to the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast with your host, Brett Gilliland. 
be sure to leave a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. You may also want to visit our website, EliteEntrepreneursPodcast.com, to find additional resources to grow your business from seven figures to 10 million and beyond. <laughs>